Uh, my name is uh, J.D. Balakrishnan and I'm the uh, Associate Dean Academic and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this small celebration of uh, our Calgary Youth Science Fair award-winning scientist. It might appear that what does uh, business school have to do with science fair awards, right? Uh, but the fact is, sort of deep down, we've been always working with scientists. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the three uh, recipients, uh, Zoe there, Zoe Dingerman, there's Joe, Joe Willis is here, and Elizabeth uh, Vanderfoot. Thanks to them for taking time off. Is it a school day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, do each of you have a short presentation, I think? Uh, yes, around seven minutes. Around seven minutes? Perfect. So, for my project, I wanted to develop a gluten-free donut because I'm gluten intolerant and I have been for about three years. And also, during the winter break, I had gone to a Krispy Kreme donut shop and there were all those yummy spelling donuts. And also, I asked the person there if they had a gluten-free and they said that three other people had asked the same day. And it, it's really challenging to make a gluten-free donut because gluten adds the binding to flour and when you're baking cookies or muffins you have that pan or tin there to hold it in but when you're cooking donuts you just drop it in oil so for my I use six flours and for each donut I only used one flour to make it simpler because usually with gluten-free items there are like six different flours and it's hard and complicated to bake at home so I use corn flour tapioca flour potato flour chickpea flour, white rice flour, and brown rice flour. So for the corn flour, it rose a lot, but the donuts were very hard to form and it's kind of sticky and liquidy. For the tapioca flour, it ended out way too liquidy to make donuts, so that was not possible. For potato flour, it ended up just in tiny little dough balls, and even when I would put all my pressure on it, it just would crumble apart. For chickpea flour, the dough was very sticky and firm, and it was very hard to make into a donut, so they came out like donut blobs, <laughs> and they tasted like lima beans, so it was really unpleasant. <laughs> for, for white rice flour, the flour didn't rise, but it held together very well. It didn't crumble, and it was easy to put in. For the brown rice flour, it didn't rise also, but the donuts were harder to form and it had cracks and it was more oily in the inside. So I, for my grading system for each donut, I used a rubric I developed from, because first before I started making gluten-free donuts, I tried just making normal wheat flour donuts and I made an evaluation system based on that. So in the end, the white rice flour performed the best, but I still wasn't happy with the results because it was still firm and it, was kind of dense so I wanted to get the best so I added white rice flour and corn flour into one donut because the corn flour rose and the white rice flour held together the donuts came out oily and one fell apart and they weren't very good so I added so for my next donut I did white rice flour corn flour and xanthan gum xanthan gum is very regular used in gluten-free baking because it works as a binding agent, kind of as a replacement for gluten. So those turned out very well. They turned, they exceeded my expectations, getting a fives in all categories. And yes, so thank you for your time. <laughs> There are recipes there for gluten-free donuts yep. as well, so I'm going to try one myself. Thank you. You're welcome. So my project's Decarbonize Alberta, and it was on reducing Alberta's carbons emission, carbon emissions because on this chart right here, which is content of electricity versus price, you can see we have pretty dirt. Uh, it's pretty dirty and cheap electricity, so I figured we needed a better way of that. And I chose nuclear um, kind of before I even started the project, um, mostly because it's, uh, it's 
very energy dense and it does and it has a great safety record. Um, so for the fuel, most of the conventional reactors use uranium-235, which is 0.7% of all natural uranium. But I decided to use thorium because it can be used more efficiently in reactors. So you can thorium can't be fissioned directly, so it needs to be bred. You fire a neutron at thorium-232, becomes thorium-233, which in 22 seconds becomes protactinium-233, which in 27 days becomes uranium-233, which can be fissioned directly creating two more neutrons to continue the chain reaction. And for spent fuel, most people think spent fuel is a problem, but it's actually really useful. For example, most of the spent fuels can be used in medical diagnostics, and um, iodine-131 can be used in treating thyroid cancer. So they have a lot of use for them. Also, because I'm using thorium, you can use them more efficiently, and you can reuse spent fuel because our modern day reactors are only 3% efficient, but the main problem is we have such old reactors. So, for radiation, most people think there's a real difference between man-made radiation and just natural radiation, but there actually isn't. There is three types of radiation. Alpha, which can't penetrate through a piece of paper. Beta, which can't penetrate through aluminum. And gamma, which basically penetrates through everything, including lead, although lead does slow it. So. Alpha is the most dangerous and gamma is the least dangerous, but even the smallest amount of radiation needs to be respected. And by the standards they judge current nuclear reactors, they should evacuate areas like Denver and bananas shouldn't be legal. So, <laughs> the elephant in the room when talking about nuclear is the nuclear reactants like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. Though these were all different designs and locations, they all have a few things in common. They were all caused by human error and they were all high pressure reactors. As well, they were all very old designs. Chernobyl was caused by misinterpreting instructions. Three Mile Island was caused by confusion over the position of a human operated relief switch. And Fukushima was caused by being overcautious with the tsunami. And on the desk per terawatt hour of electricity, you can see even though all these accidents, nuclear is still the safest, and ironically, it's safer than wind and solar. So the solution, I believe the solution is nuclear because of its energy density and safety record, but I don't believe in the reactors currently in use because they're inefficient, they take a long time, and they're very expensive to build. So I chose Lifter, the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, because it's at atmospheric pressure, so in the event of a meltdown, you don't have gas buildups, uh, which cause Three Mile Island and other things. Well, they basically all cause the accidents is because of lack of coolant. And um, as well, it uses molten salt, and that's why it's able to be at atmospheric pressure, because it has a boiling point of 1,300 degrees Celsius, and the reactor won't ever get that hot, even in a meltdown. And it's walk away safe, well, walk away. You still probably don't want to walk away on an active reactor. Um, so you have a freeze plug at the bottom, which is made of salt, not of ice, because of how high the temperatures get. And so in the event of a meltdown, it will get too hot to cool this block right here. And so all of the coolant and the fuel will put, be put into a dump tank where they can be safely managed. As well, there's different designs that are meant to be easier and more efficient but I like that version of lifter because you can e it's modular. You can make them either very large or massive. They range from about the size of a pickup truck to a skyscraper. So, and then I have the economy. And because nuclear is baseload power, um, it doesn't work too well in areas with a lot of solar. So you can see this is a California duck chart. It has a bit of a belly right here. Because of, the, um, because of how much solar. And that's a prediction of how much solar they have right now. This blue line is the actual. And so nuclear could only run at the bottom of the belly, and it's not very useful. But because Alberta doesn't have much solar, we have the Alberta whale chart. And um, so it can run at the bottom of the tail, which is a lot more power. And so there's not too much left over for natural gas or renewables. And the typical Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland generation stack 
you can see nuclear turns on at about $50.88 per megawatt hour, which is bulk. We pay about double that. Um, so, and nuclear is, can run at about $20 per megawatt hour. So, the, and on the EROI, it's, uh, it, well, it's energy returned on invested. So it returns 75 times the amount of energy invested into actually getting fuel and all that. And the economical threshold is 7.5 times. So the, eco the economics of running a nuclear power plant in Alberta won't be a problem. And the oil sands, because we provide 10% of Canada's energy and so much jobs and money, we need to keep them running. But at the same time, we, they also are a lot of our emissions. And if they plan on getting worse. So I was thinking we could use nuclear to do that. And so on the energy to produce one barrel of oil sands oil, you can see thorium, it takes about six grams to produce a barrel of oil sands oil, 159 liters about. And it takes 12,000 grams of coal instead. So there's a very large difference. And even if you exaggerate these numbers, for example, we were, uh, extracting 60 million barrels of oil a day, you can still hardly see how much, th how many kilograms of thorium we would need compared to coal. And so my conclusion of the project is, the re is that um, fission is safer than burning. We can decarbonize Alberta and nuclear power can be the baseline for at least the next millennia. Thank you. interesting project and I don't know about anyone else but I want to know um, when I come around later to talk to you why we need to evacuate Denver and why bananas <laughs> <laughs> I'll be asking thank you and Zoe would you like to tell us about your project sure so basically what I did was I made an algorithm that can accurately predict cooking times or alternatively give the user suggestions for how to adjust oven temperature to achieve their desired cook time uh, the way that it works is first uh, you would put your input values into the control panel. So that would be uh, the type of meat that you're cooking, the shape of it, uh, mass, length if it's cylindrical, um, start temperature, desired end temperature, and then oven temperature, along with the recommended cooking time based on the recipe that you're following. Uh, given that, and then a table, a thermodynamic properties according to which type of meat you indicated you're cooking, uh, it calculates the heat transfer coefficient that the recipe assumes that piece of meat has. Uh, the way that it does that is it first calculates dimensionless time and dimensionless temperature, and then using that calculates the biot number, which is dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. Uh, given the biot number, it would uh, pull from a table a lambda and an a value, which are just constants according to that, and uh, it would calculate the error term and then run that on goal seek until that error is minimalized and uh, the actual heat transfer coefficient is found for the recipe. So that is used to plot that line right there. So that's basically the cooking pattern that the recipe is assuming it will follow. Uh, after you do that, you have your oven preheated and you put a, th I used a thermocouple, you put the thermocouple into the center of the meat and uh, start cooking that. So you run this phase until there's a significant change in temperature. So that's when it starts to follow a logarithmic trend, which you can see right there. After that, you would stop uh, recording the data and input it into your computer and it would use that segment to do a nonlinear regression. So that's the black line that's shown here. Uh, the nonlinear regression is then used to extrapolate and uh, find the actual cook time that's required to achieve your desired uh, center temperature. Given that new time, it can calculate the correct heat transfer coefficient for the meat rather than the one that the recipe assumes it has and use that to solve for oven temperature as opposed to cook time. So you could input the cook time that you would like for the item that you're cooking to have and then it would output the new oven temperature that you should change your oven to. Um, given this uh, revised temperature, um, you put the thermocouple back in and then measure how accurate it was. So I ran four trials to date, two of which were a simple prediction and two where I actually adjusted oven temperature. The ones where I did uh, predictions had a very higher square values, so they were both around 0.99. And, uh, they were off by just one or two minutes, which when you're cooking something for, you know, three hours, 
is pretty good. <laughs> um, the ones where I adjusted oven temperature were slightly less accurate. Uh, they were off by approximately 10 or 15 minutes. The reason for that is that it takes a while for the oven temperature to change, and also the meat is continuing to cook or undergo a con conduction at the rate that it was before. So in order to make that more accurate, I would simply need to take account that conduction, take, the, take into account the time that it takes for conduction to change. Um, after that, you can save the data that the algorithm finds to your log and then use that later to load, um, the start load those start conditions um, for a similar piece of meat uh, in the future and get a more accurate prediction from the start as opposed to using the one from the recipe because recipes tend to overestimate due to food and health safety concerns. Um, yeah, so you can see right here, um, that's the segment that it actually followed, so it was uh, quite accurate. Um, that was just a simple prediction one, though. Um, so in conclusion, uh, essentially uh, using this algorithm to predict oven temperature and to uh, find oven temperature adjustments to achieve your desired cook time is uh, feasible. And for in the future, I'd hope to uh, make those changes to the algorithm to make the um, temperature adjustments more accurate and uh, to develop this into the form of an app so that it's more user friendly, uh, implement the use of a Bluetooth thermometer so that you don't have to stop and load the data um, at that halfway point, and uh, you know, in the long run, implement it into the oven itself. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> All of them are incredibly interesting, and I'm hoping that everyone will stay and take a look at the projects and ask a few questions. So thank you very much for being here. Elizabeth and Joe and Zoe, thank you. Like, I guess this first part was definitely more science and programming. And then that's uh, just a close-up of how they ended out. They actually look like they would taste good, like they look fluffy. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Like, with the white rice flour, it was really kind of dense inside, and it wasn't, I didn't yeah, like it that much. Should be, like, fluffy. Kind of thing. Yeah, fluffy. Yeah, they kind of ended out hard. and. Yeah, yeah, these ones look better. Yeah. The trials where I just did prediction had R square values of about 0.99. So they're off by one or two minutes. Yeah. Uh, the ones where you're adjusting um, oven temperature were off by about 10 or 15 minutes, which when you're cooking something for three hours is pretty good. Um, the reason for that is just the time that it takes for oven temperature to change and then uh, convection rates going at the prior oven temperature. Is tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to do anything? That's why the plan um, is for oil sands, because they're already used to making very large, risky investments, then they have to wait 10 years to get their money back. Yeah. And also they're modular, so you can get like a quarter of a reactor and ship it on the bed of a pickup truck. Yeah, but you've got to convince people there's something different. Yeah. They, when they spend billions of dollars and they convince them there's something different, it's not always all that easy. China, they're actually taking their time a little bit. They're building all the factories and stuff. So once they have one done, they're planning to get like two a year and start selling them to the rest of the world. Yeah, I've been in the, the nuclear valley in yeah. northern China. I've been there. It's big. The thought is right up there. It, it was... It, like when I took it out, it was sticky and it smelled really bad. It's a really heavy flower. Isn't it? Yeah, and you can even see the donuts here like strands and like yeah. it was really weird for frying. And also, they ended, they tasted like lima beans. So, yeah, so you can see that that's off by quite a bit. Yeah. You uh, run that until it starts to follow a logarithmic trend and take that, let it run for a bit and stop and take that segment, you import it, and then it does a non-linear regression with that. So that's the black line, and then it extrapolates to predict the actual cook time that it'll take to get to the desired end temperature. 
that's what you Yeah, so that part, um, the part where you're just uh, recording that, doing the regression, and then predicting, yeah. uh, that's already been done by a couple um, different kinds of thermometers. Where it gets a little bit more interesting is when you take that new cook time.